All right, so my name is Ernesto. I'm the program director at Quantified Self Labs. Um, who here knows what Quantified Self is? A few people. So I'm going to go into a really quick background, and then we're going to get into the fun stuff, and we're going to talk a little bit about some data. OK, so this gentleman is Kevin Kelly. Kevin Kelly was one of the founding editors of Wired Magazine. Who's ever read Wired Magazine? All right, you're my geeks. Great. So Kevin Kelly, along with his writing partner, and another editor and writer at Wired Magazine, Gary Wolf, in 2008 got together and said, Wired was all about the personal computer and its impact on our lives, our society, and our culture. But that has come to pass. We all have computers now. We're all using them in lots of different ways. What's the next thing? Threw a bunch of words on the whiteboard, figured out that computing is getting even more personal than the laptops that we had on our desks, and at that point, the very, very first iPhone that was in our pocket. So what's happened is we, through Kevin and Gary's work, we've developed a network of communities around the world. We have over 111 communities now of individuals who are talking about the role of personal data, data that they're collecting about their own lives and its impact it, during their life, how it impacts their behavior, and what behavior changes they see. So, those meetings take a variety of different ways, but a lot of times it's just like this. It's probably slightly actually smaller than this meeting. But an individual will come up, come and give a presentation, and they'll answer three very specific questions. What did you do? How did you do it? And what did you learn? And those questions, although simple, have led to just an explosion of different tools, techniques, and methods that people are encountering and using in their own lives through the lens of technology. Uh, if you ever want to see any of these talks, I highly recommend you at least take a peek at them because they're, they're just fantastic. We have individuals that are just doing things like just simply measuring their weight or their physical activity, doing things like for weight loss or to improve their nutrition. But we have fantastic, amazing talks like this gentleman, you're, you're right. Top right, uh, second one in, this gentleman with the red shirt, that's Roger Craig. He actually used self-tracking for knowledge retention and went on to be one of the highest uh, paid winners in Jeopardy history. Um, so that's just like fun stuff. But most of these people, like in the reality, are trying to understand their health. It's the most important question that these people have. And it's where a lot of the tools and technologies that are coming to fore in our culture are really trying to impact people. And that's kind of what I'll talk a little bit about um, in just a second. So that's mainly what we do in QS, is we really try and help people across a wide variety of age ranges and technical backgrounds, um, across cultural backgrounds all over the world, understand the role of technology in their own lives and what they can do. We also uh, work with public health institutions and uh, funding agencies like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to bring to together individuals, companies, and researchers, and public health groups to understand the role of technology for not understanding personal health, but how that technology and that data that people are collecting through the course of their everyday lives can impact public health as well. This is a picture from our last Quantified Self and Public Health Symposium, which actually held also here in San Diego with our partners at the University of California, San Diego. And it's, it's pretty fantastic, but it's still very, very early. Um, we're trying, trying really hard to bring uh, the commercial entities to the conversation, but public health, I'm sure as some of you know, isn't at the top of the stack when it comes to people that are wondering about when their next IPO is going to be. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about behavior, because that's what we really, really care about, right? So why is measurement, and that's really the focus of QS, why is measurement so important in the conversation when we talk about behavior? For years, hundreds and hundreds of years, we've wanted to know what people do. Unfortunately, what people do in their own lives is hard. Like Neil deGrasse Tyson says here, this isn't physics. We can't just like set up an experiment. We can't set up a large hadron collider, throw some atoms together, and be like, all right, well, we know why people are eating Big Macs. It, it's not that easy. Um, but we're trying to understand, you know, because we have starting to develop tools and techniques to understand what we can do to actually measure what people are engaging, how they're engaging with their own behavior through the course of their life. Who here has ever used or filled out a self-report measure? Who here trusts 
what they actually put down on that self-report measure. <laughs> One person, all right, you have a really good validated measure. Um, but we know, like, you know, this is what we've done in public health in the past. I'm, I'm a PhD student in public health. I, I understand, like, the background here is when we try to understand what people are doing, we usually just say, hey, do you remember how much activity you had? Do you remember what you ate for breakfast? Do you guys remember what you ate for breakfast yesterday, two days ago, three days ago? It's, it's hard. This, this understanding is hard, but it's vitally important if we're ever going to impact people's behavior or even measure the success of a program. So the good thing is, is we have a long history of trying to understand what's going on with people. This is one of the very, very first ECGs, electrocardiogram, um, developed in the Netherlands. It weighed 600 pounds. You had to dip one hand and the other hand and one foot into some electrolyte solution, and that would actually print out the waveform of your heart rate. 600 pounds, though. But again, this is 1900. Fast forward about 115 years. Now we can do it on your wristwatch. You can just pull up your Apple Watch here. You can look at my heart rate, which says like 122, which is way too high. And all we have to use is a little bit of light, some really fancy algorithms. And we can track people's heart rate every second, or in the case of the Apple Watch, every five seconds to 10 minutes, depending on how funky you move. And it's great. And we can learn a lot, a lot of things. So we're in this age now where we're developing and we're able to use, both in our personal lives, but also in our research and our public health programs, tools that can measure the actual human behaviors that are going on in the course of everyone's everyday life. We can measure how many steps you take. We can measure how much you weigh. We can measure your heart weight. There are even systems and programs that can be installed on the mobile phones we use every day that can use some pretty interesting advanced algorithms to figure out, is this person depressed? And maybe should I interact with them? Should I pair them with a mental health counselor to get them out of the house, to get them to talking to their friends and their colleagues a little bit more? If you're interested in that kind of work, I highly recommend looking up a company from the Boston area called Ginger.io. They've been one of the, the forerunners in this area. OK, so I want to talk a little bit about data because I can't go through a QS presentation without showing my actual data. Um, if you were wondering, like, what does it matter? The, these tools don't really do anything. Uh, I would say that they're actually supremely powerful, and the information that you can get from them is not only looks interesting, is interesting, and can be useful. Um, this is a scatter plot of every single step I took in 2012 from my Fitbit device. It's over 544 data points. It's one point per minute. Um, who here can tell when I usually go for a run? It's actually, it's right there. So I was told not to go past this X, but. So this is just, you know, the steps per minute, basically. And you can see at the very, very top, this is about 4 to 6 PM. That's when I'm usually going for a run. So if we know this from a public health standpoint, maybe someone could actually develop an intervention that says, hey, you only exercise at this point in time. Maybe you should think about exercising at other points during your day. Or maybe this is the point in time where you say, hey, you only go for a run for like 15 or 20 minutes. Maybe tomorrow go for a little bit longer. We can use this kind of data. But Fitbit, we all kind of know that that's kind of a fun thing. You can get your steps. That's great. But one of the great things that I think that we can understand is the actual course of people's lives across time. Um, I use an application called Moves that was developed in Europe. It is now unfortunately part of the big Facebook machine. Um, take of that what you will. And, but it uses background sensing on um, both Android. It's available on Android and iOS. It uses your GPS in your phone as well as the accelerometer and gyroscope to understand what you're actually doing. So it can actually detect when you're walking, when you're running, when you're cycling, when you're driving, and also where you go. So I live in Los Angeles. This is every single place I've ever walked over the last three years that I have lived there. You can, if you want to guess where I live, I live on the west side. I rarely go downtown. I spend no time um, pretty much anywhere else other than in my neighborhood. Um, but you can also see other patterns. My running patterns, though, are completely different than my walking patterns, partly because I'm part of a, um, a running group, and we try and run all over the, the city of Los Angeles looking for interesting street art. It's amazing. Um, 
And then you can also see where I cycle, where I spend my time. So this is interesting for me personally, and I'm going to get a little bit to why, like, why would public health people or why would people in government care about this kind of data? I'll get there in just a sec. Um, here's my weight. So every morning, step on a scale, weigh myself with the Y thing scale, and you can see I have uh, was good, grad school, work, I'm trying to get better, and I'm, I feel like I'm doing a better job. And start, I'm on the downslope. But, you know, typically, this information would be hard to get. You know, in most cases, about six years ago, the best you could do is give someone a piece of paper, or if they were really technically savvy, ask them to enter something in Excel. I step on my scale in the morning every day. It automatically goes to the cloud. I can see it on my phone. I can see it on the web. And I can actually push it to other systems or organizations through APIs. And the steps and the weight and the location, that's all great. But we're really in an era where if you have a question about your life, you are probably going to be able to answer that with real objective information. So anything from your jawbones, your garments to, uh, for measuring physical activity to blood pressure cuffs, weight. On the top uh, right hand is the Alive Core. Actually, that's an older version of it, which was a uh, mobile phone mounted clinical grade ECG device. Um, they actually have FDA clearance for detecting and uh, monitoring arrhythmias. Um, you have smart. Uh, thermometers. You can measure your ECG. This is what this headband is. Um, I've used one. It's pretty crazy. It actually um, is meant for guiding you through meditation and stress reduction and relaxation. Um, one of the things that I think is most interesting is our new era of smart pills. Have anyone heard of Proteus yeah. Biomedical? It's crazy. Um, basically, they put almost what is literally like a grain of sand on a pill you ingest that, you wear a little patch, as soon as that comes into contact with your stomach acid, it just sends a little signal that says, hey, I'm here. And that's it. But that patch is measuring your heart rate, it's measuring your activity, and it's going to send that information to a medical professional. You're doing tuberculosis treatment where you really need to get people to take a pill every single day. These are the type of things that you might want to include in that program. It's expensive, but probably a little bit less expensive than having someone go to that person's house every single day to just watch them take a pill. Um, this little weird rock thing is an eye beacon. Eye beacons are really interesting, but all we ever hear about is how they're used in advertising. They're really um, small little uh, Bluetooth sensors, basically. They understand when your phone comes into contact with them. They've gotten a lot of press over the last few years about using them at shopping malls and other commercial locations so that you can get real-time coupons for things that you're actually near. But what if we use this to understand what people are doing and actually send them messages right when they need it? Um, there's a program, a really, really small pilot program uh, through the University of California, San Diego, uh, funded by Robert Wood Johnson and Arizona State University, where they're trying to understand, can we use these in people's homes to deliver them health messages right when they need them the most? Like, can I know that you're actually on your couch watching TV? And because you have your phone, we know that you're not moving. So what if a commercial comes up and I can prompt you right then and there, because I know you're there, to get up and move, to just do two minutes of physical activity? So uh, it's like, this is like very new areas, but it's super fun. And then you have the, the, just the wide range of stuff that doesn't live on a chip, things like 23andMe. Who's here has their DNA tested through 23andMe? Great. It's gotten some bad press in the past. Didn't have FDA clearance for a while. It's coming back. Hopefully, people are going to be able to learn some really interesting things from it. But 23andMe, you know, they're, they're the ones you can do your own uh, genetic testing. But genomes aren't the only thing. What about your microbiome? What about all that bacteria that's in your mouth and your gut? There's companies like Ubiome, where you can actually go and send them samples, and they will test your microbiome for you. Such, you can also use things on your apps, like measuring your sleep. You can use things like Strava, RunKeeper, to measure your physical activity, your location, how fast you run, or where you go. It's, it's almost never ending, the amount of things. Um, this slide quickly got out of hand, and I had to actually pare it down, just because it had been crazy how many things are out there. Um, so what is, what is actually happening here? In terms of what these tools are enabling us to do, is they're giving us 
access to a huge number of users. I was just looking at a report the other day that said that mobile health shipments, so the wearable devices, is going to be about 200 million in 2016. These are companies that are bringing in billions and billions of dollars from people that are going out on their own to try and understand their health. From a public health standpoint, this is, like, is mind-blowing. We've for so long tried to get people to care about what's going on. And all of a sudden, someone just said, hey, look at this little fancy watch that you can wear. And people are like, oh, yeah, totally, I get it. Let's do this. You know, you look at the Fitbits, the Jawbones, those people in the world, their, their user groups are in the millions. Um, I've long said that I think these companies have a greater understanding of physical activity in the United States probably than what we understand through our organizations and our research through like NHANES or any of those projects. But not only do they have these huge numbers of people, people are using these things for a long time. So you have this deep understanding of human behavior because it's not only big, but it's, ha it's longitudinal. So like I said, you, know, you saw my Fitbit data, my moves, my weight. It's years and years and years and years of information that people are collecting. Who here has an iPhone 5S or above? Who here has an Android phone that they bought in the last two years? Awesome. You can open up those phones right now, Apple Health, Google Fit, um, on each side, and you can understand your own physical activity, your own health. Your phone's already doing this stuff for you, and it's keeping all this information longitudinally. The other part here is that it, this information is real time. This isn't the day where, at the end of the day, you had to crack open that pedometer. And you saw, oh, I got 8,000 steps. You write that down. Maybe you can do better next time. This is the day where that information is being shared across systems as soon as it happens. As soon as I step on that scale, as soon as I take a step, as soon as I end a run, that information is available for people to interact with. And that's where I think the magic is waiting to happen. So I've got a few examples of some, some different uh, projects that I think would be interesting for you in the audience to understand in terms of what can this data actually do and how might we think about how to interact with the people and the companies that are producing this. So who here uses uh, Strava? to run. It's a um, few of you here. It's, it's basically an application for runners and cyclists, a little bit like hiking, um, to get people to map and share how fast or how far they run. Um, you can also win things like how fast a certain section of the road is for you. They uh, released in 2015 a program called Strava Metro, where they're trying to partner with public agencies to, so that they can understand what people are doing in their locality. So uh, they actually partnered, um, their most high profile one right now is with the Oregon Department of, Oregon, uh, State of Oregon Department of Transportation. Um, they gave them basically an anonymous data set. All they'd have is counts for the number of people on a certain road section. And the Department of Transportation is trying to understand how can we actually impact our, our urban planning process based on what people are actually doing out there on the road. Um, if you want to just explore the kind of data they have, you can actually, I think it's like labs at Strava or labs.strava.com. They have a, just a free open data set. It's just visualized. You can't download anything. And you can see exactly where people are going and where they're exercising. Uh, on the left-hand side here, you actually have our beautiful city of San Diego. We currently are actually right here. Um, I don't know if it's a public health problem, but lots of people like running by the airport. If you guys have driven over here, you realize like this is actually like one of the most unsafe roads, probably. Um, I don't know if I was you, but I wouldn't want to fight people that are late for their plane if I'm on my bike. Um, I know there's a lot of people here from DC on the right. We have our wonderful city, or our wonderful um, uh, DC area here. So you can definitely see where people are going and what's going on. This is still very, very new. Many of these companies are very hesitant to release this type of information because, spoiler alert, it's very, very personal. I may not want people to know exactly where I go. I may not want people to have a copy of my DNA. Um, personally, that's actually not the case. You can get my DNA online, um, <laughs> which is another story for another time. Um, but 
they're, they're actively working through these issues of privacy, confidentiality, and how to actually best interact with public organizations like governments, like public health researchers, so that they can start to answer these pressing questions we have. Um, another project that's spun out of the Personal Genome Project in New York, or out of Harvard, um, is Open Humans. Open Humans is a really fascinating research um, project in that they believe that one of the reasons why people don't engage with the research process, the public health process, is because they don't see a benefit from giving their information to a researcher, to a public health entity, and not seeing anything in return, of not being part of the actual research process. And so they've kind of flipped this idea on their head by going completely fully open. So people um, can join the open human system and contribute data that they are collecting about their everyday life through a variety of different research programs and have it kind of basically be open source. So as a researcher, I can come in and say, this is exactly what I'm doing, and this is exactly what I do with your data. Let me look at what's going on in your life. So they're still fairly new. Um, they have a few projects like the Personal Genomes Project, which is open source genetic data, American Gut, open source microbiome data, um, the uh, Go Viral, which is actually trying to crowdsource flu rates through um, the entire United States. Uh, if someone in your family has the flu that you, or you think that you have the flu, immediately please go to Go Viral. It's amazing. They will send you a little spit tube, and you can actually test whether or not that person has the flu, and they'll actually map it for you. Um, but they're also doing really interesting things, interesting things very uh, similar to what Strava is doing. They have this keeping pace study where if you're a RunKeeper user, you can donate that data because there's a researcher in New York who's really understood about the built environment and its impact on physical activity. Um, the last project is a little bit tangential, but I can't talk about the role of technology in our everyday life without talking about something like this. Um, I learned about this a few years ago through some of our projects, um, interactions with the, the type 1 diabetes community. Um, data, if, if you don't know, is supremely important to individuals with type 1 diabetes. Um, for a lot of, of people, um, a lot of uh, writers have said that individuals with type 1 are the original self-trackers. They've been doing this for decades. You know, whether it's measuring blood glucose, measuring their food, measuring their insulin. It's really important for people to understand what's going on during the course of their, life, their lives. Um, recently, there's been some really great technical uh, capacity built into the type 1 diabetes ecosystem, mainly through what's called a continuous glucose monitor. It's a little thing. You can wear it on your body, subcutaneous little piece of wire. It's measuring your blood glucose every five minutes. You don't have to do any finger pricks anymore. Fantastic. You can have this little... This little basically it looks like a, it actually looks pretty much like this, has a little screen. That little device on your body sends a little signal here. You have a little display of your blood glucose over time. You can make decisions about what you should be eating, make decisions about your insulin dosing, all sorts of fun stuff. But the problem is, is what if you're someone that has a kid or a family member who has type 1 diabetes? Maybe you might want to see that information as well. Well, some really enterprising fathers got together and said, well, we want to know how this thing actually works. And they, um, quote unquote, hacked into the software. We were able to figure out how the communication strategies were actually working. And they were able to design a system which has blossomed this entire online community where people are creating open source ways for people to uh, share their blood glucose data across the internet. So, I would really recommend looking into the Night Scout community. They have a Facebook group that pretty much makes me cry every time I see it. Um, because time and time again, you're seeing stories about people who are able to live a more normal life. Stories about parents who can actually go on dates for the first time because they can leave their child with a babysitter because their blood glucose from their child is on their wristwatch and they know exactly what's going on. Um, kids are able to go on sleepovers for the very first time because their parents are more comfortable with letting them out of their sight. Um, this, is, this is kind of like the, the rose-tinted glasses of personal data. This is when data can really make a huge impact. And the reason it makes that impact is because that data is now being able to be shared across <coughs> boundaries. It's not stuck in a silo. It's not being used by one commercial entity. It's being used to really 
benefit the people that need it the most. And I'm going to um, wrap up here by basically saying that we, we really take technology, I think, for granted. And we think of this as just like ways for people to bring big data into our lives, for data to really answer these questions that we have about what people are doing and how they're doing it and how we can make them do it better. But as this, our technical prowess starts to grow, as we're able to measure things at a higher frequency with greater validity, with really knowing what's going on, we have to, I think, keep in mind that at the end of the day, the data is, um, data is people, right? It's, it's not just information that's out there in the blue. It's not being made by robots. It's being made by people. You know, every single one of those numbers from a Dexcom continuous glucose monitor comes because someone's wearing it. That's people's actual data. And if we keep that in mind, I think we really can keep in mind the fact that the data is not there to just like answer some unknown. It's to help people lead a better life. I have a quote up here from, um, a writer that I know who's also been using a Fitbit for a long time, and he actually just this past weekend published this essay about the role of that information in his life. And like a lot of people, if you talk to people about this information, it's not about the numbers. It's not about you know, the data. They're not super weird geeks like me who care about making graphs. They care about what impact it can have, and it can have this amazing impact if we let it. Um, so I think that's it. Hopefully, you guys can have a nice day now. Get out of the, the room here. If you have any questions, um, you can direct them to my different channels. Thank you. Thank you.